I see it now. So I think that we might uh, as well start with uh, a round of presentations. This meeting is being recorded. The recording has stopped. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Okay, so I think we can start. Yes, our... indeed. Okay, so welcome to the 176th Mercury in Nexa, Nexa Wednesday. Uh, this is uh, an appointment that has been going on for uh, many years already. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure and a honor to have here today uh, Dr. Dan McKillan from uh, Goldsmith uh, University of London, uh, better known for being the author of, uh, of a book that has been uh, uh, widely read and commented in our, in our group, uh, Resisting AI, an Anti-Fascist Approach to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, is a, a, a book that uh, has uh, quickly become uh, a, a leading uh, research on uh, on AI uh, as a, um, a critique to the uh, dominant narrative about AI on on both sides. Uh, the, the dominant narrative has two aspects that are uh, two sides of the same coin in my in, in my view. So the techno enthusiast narrative and the apocalyptic narrative about uh, uh, AI. So the contribution of uh, Dr. McKillen has been mainly to, uh, uh, to figure out uh, forms of resistance uh, against uh, uh, the algorithmic violence of which uh, AI is uh, at the moment uh, uh, the main expression. So um, I will uh, leave uh, the floor in one minute to, to Dan for his presentation titled An Anti-Fascist Approach to AI Means uh, Decomputing. Uh, as in the tradition of the, uh, of the next uh, Wednesdays, we will uh, have a quick uh, uh, tour uh, of, the, of the table just to introduce ourselves to the uh, to the speaker so that uh, he knows whom he's uh, uh, talking to. My name is Maurizio Borghi, I'm the co-director of the Nexa Center, and uh, I am um, a professor of intellectual property law at, uh, at the University of uh, Turing. Uh, My name is Antonio Sant'Angelo, I am um, a senior research fellow at the Nexa Center, and I, I am a semiotician and I teach uh, semiotics of digital cultures at the University of Turin. I'm Gian Mogonti, project manager here at NEXA. My background is also a low background. My name is Antonio Retro, I'm professor of computer engineering here at Polytechnic Institute and member of NEXA. Uh, I'm Marco Rondina, uh, I'm a computer engineer and a PC student here at the, the NEXA Center, and uh, I'm working on the responsible use and development of AI. Uh, I'm Lorenzo Lodadio. I'm a PhD student uh, here at Polytechnic Torino in software engineering. I'm David I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer at a company called Globa. I've been in an exit for the past. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have many fellows uh, have connected uh, uh, online. I suggest uh, that after the, um, um, the presentation by, by Dan, everyone to introduce briefly themselves if they want to ask questions uh, online. There will be, we will open the floor to uh, a mixed uh, discussion on site and, uh, and uh, online. So uh, then the floor is yours. Thanks very much. <laughs> and thanks very much for the invitation to speak to the seminar, uh, particularly thank you to Maurizio. I mean, it's amazing, you know, 176th session. Uh, is really outstanding and uh, you know i really hope that it turns out that these seminars um have lasted and will continue to last longer 
than the current wave of AI. But um, anyway, it is truly distinguished. Um, yeah, so um, I'll pull up some slides in a second. They're just illustrative, really, um, mainly there to save you having to look too much at my face, I think. Um, uh, so I do have some slides. I don't really have exactly pose myself a set of questions, um, which I then answer to myself. Um, but I thought that might help um, provoke other questions from people because it would be really interesting to have the discussion. I'm in looking forward to the discussion. So I, I've posed a set of questions to myself, basically. I also will say in advance that um, I'm, I'm aware of a, an almost uncontrollable tendency to speak too quickly. Uh, and I apologize particularly because, um, you know, you, you're almost all doing this in a second, you know, listening to me in a second language, which I couldn't do. And uh, so I will try not to accelerate too much. I'll try not to be a vocal accelerationist. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, having said that, um, I mean, we'll have some discussion at the end. If there's something that's really uh, incomprehensible in, in what I'm saying, perhaps because I've said it too fast, please do feel free to ask me to repeat or explain. <clears throat> so the questions I wanted to have um, a crack at answering today are, um, does AI actually work? Uh, why is so much being invested in AI? Um, will AI fix our public services? <laughs> if I'm an educator, but I don't embrace AI, does that make me a Luddite? Um, did Francis Galton invent deep learning? Is AI fascist? Will AI save us from climate change? Does decomputing mean that I have to get rid of my laptop? And how do we resist AI? Yeah, I think I'll embark on those, but let me pull up some pictures at least. So, as I say, there's a little bit more of an attractive backdrop. You guys can see see the first image, okay? Yes. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, so I mean, start with a really, really basic question: Does AI work? And I think it's important to be quite specific about what we mean by AI, which is really impossible to, you know, has very blurry boundaries. But when I'm talking about AI in this case, I'm particularly referring to forms of computing based on neural networks. And, you know, obviously these things have been around for a long time. This is the Mark I perceptron. So that's 1957 or 1958. You know, they've been around for 70 years or more. So they're not a sci-fi tech from the future. And, the, you know, I would say the reason they've really taken off over the last 10 years or so is it's mainly because of the availability of data. So looking at social media and the availability of um, some very specific chips with the GPUs, <clears throat> you know, plus the fact that neural networks are, are genuinely a good approx, you know, they're a good generalizable approximation to functional transformation. So if you do have some data, preferably if you do have a lot of data and you've got something you want to connect that data to in terms of outputs, then you've got a pretty good chance of um, being able to construct some architecture of neural networks that will connect those two things, which, you know, is, is pretty cool in its own way. Um, you know, if, if, if there's some kind of pattern that can connect the two things, the AI will find it or and or make it up, which we'll come back to. But the important thing about those patterns to me is that they're only ever correlations. You know, there's not any causality involved or any world model, I would say, others say differently. Uh, and again, others say differently, but I'd say there's no understanding at all in what's going on. Um, which to me means that whether you're talking about deep learning on the one hand or transformer models on the other hand, AI is always faking it, even when the answer is right. And this isn't a fault that can be fixed. This is This to me is inherent in the neural network mechanism and, you know, in the back propagation algorithm, which was just awarded essentially the Nobel Prize in the form of Jeff Hinton, you know, th th this is just the way it's made. So the correct answers that come out of ChatGPT and the so-called hallucinations that come out of ChatGPT, they are equally optimized. And on an even more basic level, um, this very generalizability to me means that and I think it's very demonstrated also actually in the figure of Jeff Hinton, which I'll come back to, that the power of AI being this very generalizable solution that only relies on data and architecture means that you don't really have to worry too much about having domain knowledge. In the old days, as many people gathered here might remember, if you were doing machine learning, 
and you wanted to get any any kind of meaningful results, you you would have to make some effort to engage with whoever it was who was a specialist in the area you were trying to work with, you know, healthcare or um, you know, car manufacturer, whatever it is, you'd have to have some, you'd have to exchange domain understanding with the people who knew what was going on. And in the case of AI, that's kind of, it's almost seen as a virtue to, in, in the industry not to have to do that. Or it, yeah. So I think that's um, deeply problematic. <clears throat> and, and also the fact that one of uh, predictive AI, so I, I tend to divide AI into the current, this kind of AI, neural network based stuff. I I'd, I'd divide it into predictive AI and generative AI. So predictive AI, I think, in some ways has far more profound uh, social and political implications than um, generative AI. Uh, and one of the primary applications of, of predictive AI is uh, some or other form of risk modeling. So that really means um, producing judgments of some kind uh, based on relatively superficial differences in data, while at the same time, actually making more opaque the underlying structural determinants of that situation. Um, so to answer my own question, does AI work? To me, definitely not. If, if, you're, if you're making some claim that you've got a technology that understands anything. And, and also definitely not if you're actually looking for something uh, that you can trust. I think it does work. I think it works as an anti-worker technology um, because AI turns out to have a great facility to um, support the surveillance or control or even um, now with generative AI, the replacement of workers. Um, and I think it's also a massive diversion from exactly those kind of structural issues that I was saying, you know, AI is so good, if you like, at evading. So given that there are many, many acknowledged problems with AI, and um, so far it seems even to the industry and practitioners to be a solution in search of a, a killer application, why is there so much being invested in AI? Oops, got to remember to have, I've got slides here. There we go. I mean, this was a few months ago, but we probably all remember that at some point this year anyway, um, NVIDIA who produces the chips, so they're making the shovels for the, you know, in, in for the gold rush, their valuation um, was bigger than Apple's. I think they were the, at some point the most highly capitalized company in the world for a brief period, right? So what, what, and, and then there's all the investment in the physical infrastructure. There's, there's Microsoft building, uh, sorry, opening through a date, new data center somewhere in the world every three days. You know, that's from their own, you know, that's from their voice themselves. I mean, this is incredible. So what's going on? I think, in general, my interpretation would be, and also from having um, looked at quite a few of the framework documents and proposals coming out of the EU, for example, that there's a general belief or a, uh, that the AI is, is the future of economic growth and also the future of geopolitical influence. I mean, these, it's absolutely um, embraced as, as core to these things. And I think there are reasons for that, but not because AI can actually do those things. It's, I think the reasons, I, if I were looking for reasons, I would look far more in current conditions. I would look at the fact that we're still in a, an austerity that's lasted since the financial crash. I'd say that um, we're in a period of, you know, post COVID as well, which has caused all of the uh, disruptions that it has, that we're in, a, we're in a climate crisis. And there's a generalized fracturing, I would say, of the neoliberal world order, you know, that the wheels are coming off as they say. And so I'm proposing that the answer to the question, why is so much invested in AI, is really because the system, if I can say it like that, um, doesn't really have any answers. Uh, but AI is one of the things it can throw at this, what you might call a poly crisis, so a multiple crisis. It doesn't have any answers for this. Things are breaking down all over the place, but at least we've got AI. We can assert that AI will help solve these things, will throw AI at it. And, and most importantly, of course, as I said, using AI doesn't require you to ask difficult questions about the underlying structures of the, the fundamental social systems. So I think AI is um, masquerading as a solution while continuing uh, essentially a very neoliberal program of privatization and enclosure. So I think... Uh, 
the fundamental activity of AI is. You know, and of course, as we've seen with machine learning in Gaza, AI can and almost inevitably will become an engine of genocide and a legitimation of war crimes. So, you know, there's no doubt that military investment will continue to play a big part in AI, whatever else happens. I want to focus on more of the everyday life aspects where um, AI, to me, is a means of squeezing more out of workers and communities, claiming to fix public services. Um, well, anyway, that leads me to my next question, really, which is, can AI fix public services? <clears throat> this, this is something that the... Uh, UK government is betting on big time. Um, they absolutely subscribe to the idea that the solution to all of the critical structural problems that they've inherited is AI. So the problems here are many. For example, the first area of application is the welfare system. AI can't really fix any of the problems of the welfare system, but it does work very well as a suspicion machine. It's we've seen plenty of examples and evidence already that the algorithmicization of, of these kind of systems actually amplifies and intensifies forms of bureaucratic cruelty, absolutely ramps up um, the harsh effects on the most marginalized while further distancing the responsible bodies. Sorry, it's a funny thing. While further distancing people uh, who are responsible for those decisions from, from actually any responsibility for them. Um, oh, I just wanted to quote from the book, actually. I wrote something in the book referring to the, the effect of this process being both a material and political force, but also something that affects us in our very sense of self, if you like. So what I wrote was, the way AI constructs problems to be solved diverts our attention from the underlying issues, thereby enabling the extractivism of the status quo to continue. But in the process, it reconstructs us as subjects who can be blamed of the, as the source of the same problems. Okay, so you've got a double move here. Not only is it a false fix to those problems, it also constructs the problems in a way that essentially shifts the blame. Thinking about other vital public services, just thinking about healthcare. This is where I come to sort of having a go, Mr. Hinton. Surely, you know, there's a case for saying that um, AI's image recognition will both speed up and make more efficient and effective things like cancer scanning and radiology. And this, in fact, was a claim from Jeff back in 2016 that we don't need to, to train any more radiologists because convolutional neural networks, which were the they were the hip thing at the time, that was the hit of the early. Uh, Generate current generation of AI, you know, was was allegedly far more efficient than human beings in in analysing these scans. I mean, that turned out not to be true in 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 the real world for a number of reasons. But it also turned out that radiologists do many many other things than just scanning images, and most of those things are to do with um, relationships and understand and deep embodied understanding of situations, not just being able to uh, classify an image. So um, I have many other examples if you want to get into the discussion about medical applications. But I think the evidence here that I'm trying to lay out is that AI, AI powered services, which is what's coming in the UK, and I suspect in so many other places, will be shoddy. They will be second best. And essentially, we'll be told they're good enough for us, not good enough for people with um, resources to, to, you know, access traditional services like real doctors, for example, but they will be told they're good enough for the rest of us and they're definitely good enough for the global South. Uh, so I just want to uh, ask myself the question, if I'm an educator, but I don't embrace AI, am I a Luddite? And that's because one of the public services that's, I would say, most pervaded by AI already is education. And I'm guessing a lot of people here are you know, well, I, I know from the room, but I'm guessing many of the people gathered online have some relationship or are, are work in education themselves. This is a picture just by way of illustration of um, many UK schools are affected by a thing called RAAC, which is um, basically a form of concrete that fails after about 10 or 20 years. And it takes, you know, so we've got collapsing roofs in the schools. Um, so my answer to the question, if I'm an educator, 
and I don't want to use AI, am I a Luddite, is, yeah, maybe you are a Luddite. And that's a good thing, because the Luddites were right. Um, but let's ask some Luddite questions about AI and education. Does it serve the common good to divert funding from AI, sorry, to divert funding to AI when you've got literally collapsing roofs and schools and literally not enough teachers? Will super assistance, will AI assistance really replace teachers? Will that really boost education? Are we better off transferring pedagogy, the control of pedagogy to startups funded by venture capitalists? The fact that any of us could seriously consider this for a moment shows to me levels of incredible desperation, which aren't surprising. We're all working in you know incredibly difficult circumstances, but <clears throat> this is um, phenomenally. Um, you know, I've seen the way AI has kind of rolled over the university and school sector and people feeling that it's inevitable and they simply have to get to grips with it. And I think it's incredible. For example, one of the common arguments that I, that well, discussions, let's say, that I have about it is, oh, well, we need, you know, the, the, the young people need to embrace AI because they're going to be working with AI when they get out there. And if we don't work with AI in education, then, we're, you know, we're doing them a disservice. And I think any educator who thinks that is is, is kind of missing the point. If you think that students need to engage with AI in the world of work, you've missed the point that AI is a fundamentally anti-worker technology. It's going to immiserate students' prospects of getting work, and it's going to immiserate their experience of the workplace. But of course, it's not only educators' attitudes and, and so forth that are leading to AI finding uh, finding it so easy essentially to penetrate education it's also because education is already pre-automated you know <clears throat> years of liberal transformation of education have made it so that education is designed to be even if it doesn't always work that way scalable uh, optimized uh, standardized and these are exactly both the kind of values and, uh, and operational um, attributes that fit like a glove with um, machine learning and AI systems. So I, I, my uh, response to this question would be, rather than teaching young people to do prompt engineering, which is the you know, s apparent manipulation of large language models, I think the arrival of AI in general and generative AI in particular is, is really a prompt for us to re-examine what is going on with the state of teaching and learning. Because if we don't, and we simply allow these systems to amplify what's already there, we're going to end up with social filtering at scale. Which leads me neatly to my next question. Did Francis Galton invent deep learning? So Francis Galton was the Victorian founder of eugenics. And it turns out that there are uh, quite a lot of core connections between um, the forms of AI I'm talking about and eugenics, historically speaking. For example, the maths of linear regression and correlation, which you know, which are the heart of AI, they were developed by Francis Galton and Carl Pearson explicitly for the purposes of their eugenicist agenda. Now, um, that's not the only connection. Achieving AGI, after all, artificial general intelligence, that's the stated goal of companies like um, OpenAI, DeepMind, and many others, many of the leading companies and leading practitioners, absolutely open that this is their goal. The G in AGI goes back to the general intelligence, the G factor of Charles Spearman, who was another absolutely um, committed eugenicist. And you know the, the effect of the G factor and, and that conception of intelligence, you can follow all the way through the weaponization of the idea of IQ ever since. Even generative AI to me, although its outputs appear you know, it's superficially sort of entertaining and creative. I, I think what's happening there really is it's because the patterns are being, um, the, you know, the, the, the computations around pattern making are happening in latent data space rather than in an explicit space of images or words, which means that the product does appear to be in some way new. But, but fundamentally, those models as well, diffusion models, large language models, absolutely based on a... Um, an absolutely massive form of averaging. It's like Ketelet's average man in, in, you know, in a million dimensions. So, so what have we got? We've got deep learning, 
which excels at ranking, classifying, segregating. We've got generative AI, which to my mind is a kind of deep normativity. I think we've got everything in place for the idea of optimizing across populations through a kind of uh, ruthless reductiveness, a kind of bell curves at scale. If you know the, the book from the 1960s, and the, uh, sorry, 1970s, I think, in America, that was a response to civil rights, the idea of intrinsically different intelligences, right? But in our case, it's going to be many different kinds of bell curve that modify the distribution of people's life chances in ways that I suggest to you will designate certain kinds of people as relatively disposable. Which brings me to my next question, is AI fascist? Excuse me. So um, is AI fascist is a question I get asked a lot um, because, you know, it's my fault, right? I wrote a book subtitled An Anti-Fascist Approach. And I think it's a fair question, but I wouldn't say, it's not the way I'd describe it. I'd say fascism is a political force and AI is a techno-political phenomenon. But I do think that the, the apparatus of AI, uh, in particular, it's operations of, uh, what, what I would say is it's operations of essentializing difference of um, enabling transformative violence, of producing algorithmic states of exceptions. All of these things are tendencies that amplify what I would now probably try to sum up as microfascisms. So I'm taking the term from Deleuze and Guattari, and what I mean there are the kind of um, flows of uh, interaction in society that are that are not recognizably fascist. They're not the sort of explicit forms like a fascist party or fascist ideology, but contain within them, particularly in, in, in their power relations, particularly in the means and modes by which they're enacted. So the suggestions within these small interactions of sort of the relative values of the, of pe of the, the human beings involved, whatever it is, the small things that are constantly circulating, particularly in institutions, particularly in hierarchies, but also across society that we saw in the UK, for example, blowing up recently in literal far-right pogroms, in a literal attempt to burn uh, migrants in their hotels. These things are constant, that the potential for these activities are constantly flowing. And I think AI is a machine for intensifying those. So it's not about technological solutionism only, that's a problem, but to my mind, fascistic solutionism. <clears throat> and at the same time, it's really obvious that um, Sorry, my, my dog's just trying to break in. I'm just going to have to let her in. Oh. She'll come and say hello in a minute. I, I think I yeah, so, to ask you, I think, can you yeah, sure. explain the example you gave about England, uh, what is happening in hotels, which is... Oh, sorry, sure, yeah. Um, so there were about a month and a half ago... Um, a uh, three young girls were stabbed at a children's event, and the rumor, uh, the conspiracy theory, was spread on social media that it was um, by uh, somebody who had come over on boats across the channel, the small boats they call it in the political language here, and this was um, turned into a, a essentially a sort of call for communities to come out and seek out immigrants and um, get rid of them because they are seen as some kind of pedophile force. I mean, it's it's a, it's a combination of, of various far-right ideas, various conspiracy theories, um, but there were massive demonstrations of uh, thousands of people which were completely out of control, including, for example, trying to burn down a hotel that um, yeah. immigrants. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, we are not British, so uh, I suspect yeah, sure. other people would not understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm, I, I've not, I have a feeling there's a few other references in what I'm saying that need explaining. So I can either do it like this on the go or people feel free to ask me afterwards. I'm not sure, for example, how familiar the idea of Lud Luddism or Luddites are. So maybe we can come back to that. But I mean, I just wanted to sort of uh, finish off the kind of answer to my question is AI fascist is like, well, no, you know, AI is more of a kind of uh, fascistic solutionism. But we've also got the issue that many Silicon Valley companies seem to be run by people who um, think that uh, democracy has had its day and it's time for the tech overlords to take over. 
We've got uh, an industry itself that's completely pervaded by uh, I'd, what I'd call a kind of cosmic doomerism, uh, which, uh, you know, so ideologies like long termism, which are, are fundamentally eugenic <clears throat> and have also filtered a lot. Uh, again, here in the UK, it's quite out amazing how uh, powerfully these uh, ideologies have worked their way into government policy already. It, it, you know, and I, I'd, I'd make a general bet that any area where you hear the term AI safety has some element of this in it. And fundamentally, again, coming back to my sort of repetitive point, because AI is a diversion from structural problems, it is being used in the same way that mainstream politics also uses the far right as a distraction, as a diversion from its own failures to say, well, if not us, then them, or you know, whichever narratives fit the purpose. And they might, you know, my fundamental concern is really that these strands will become profoundly entangled in a very, in, in, it will end up with some very bad outcomes. Um, particularly with the rising tensions around the climate crisis and, uh, you know, the, the inc inevitable increase in the large scale movements of people. Which brings me to my next question. I'll just keep a track of time because. I don't want to take up too much of your time with me talking. Okay, just a few more minutes. Right, so will AI save us from climate change? And this is a brilliant picture, actually, because this is from a proposed data hyperscale data center in East London, not many not many miles from me. And you wouldn't guess, you know, it looks like a sort of um, green utopia. Um, you can just about see in the background there, there are some buildings. They also seem to be green. Um, but the, the the proposal is that you know, this is going to be a hyperscale data center, but really it's going to be a kind of cloud farm. It's going to be a wetland center. It's going to revitalize nature in this area. Yeah, anyway, whatever. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the claims that AI will save us from climate change, what, what's going on here? Right? You've got one set of claims. AI is going to optimize the energy systems that we already have. I don't think the evidence is there, but even if it is, um, that's not really the kind of change we need to reverse the general direction. On the other hand, and this is the bigger, but also uh, way more implausible claim that AI is going to be the central thing to green technologies. And it does, you know, if you look at these magic green technologies like carbon capture, most of them do have some kind of fundamental dependency on AI. But, you know, let's try to be materialist about this, right? What's actually going on with AI? We've got large language models that take something like 10 to the 23 or 10 to the 26 floating point operations. OK, weeks of time on arrays of H100s from NVIDIA. This expansion that's happening right now of these hyperscale data centers, they're like a kind of black hole, I think. They, they will swallow whole electricity grids. They will suck up whole water tables in order to cool all of this processing. While at the same time, the corporations are going to go on and on, as per the picture, about their green credentials, which, of course, is is basically nonsense. I mean, most of it is um, carbon offsets, which are just silly things, or else they are actually using renewable energy, as in Ireland, but what they're doing is they're taking all the renewable, e renewable energy that's being generated, and they're putting it into data centers, so there's no more renewable energy for anything else. And even that's not enough. We know now in America that there's a lot of good, really, investigative reporting going on at the moment. We know they're bringing gas, plant, gas plants that were shut down in order to reach carbon targets and are being brought back online to power data centers. And Microsoft has just signed a contract to take energy from a restarted nuclear power station, Three Mile Island power station. So Three Mile Island, the neighboring reactor to the one that melted down in the 1970s, right? They want to restart that just to power data centers. And at the same time, made a public statement about how they're backing off their commitments in that zero. So, you know, the idea that AI is going to you know, save us from climate change, I think, is deeply implausible. In fact, I think what's happening is we have an AI industrial complex. And what it is actually driving is the same kind of competition over energy and over mineral resources that maps one-to-one -one on the imperial expansion of the 19th century. It's a bit like the way, I'm sure people here are familiar with the, if you look at the pack, pattern of submarine cables that keep the internet going, you, you, you see the, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, imperial relations of the, of the 19th century. It's the same thing here. AI is reproducing those relationships. And those relationships at the time were justified by the same kind of eugenic ideology that I was talking about earlier on. So we've got this ridiculous recursive 
naturally enough, we've got this recursive effect. So I'm proposing a thing called decomputing at the moment. Uh, that's my that's my gig to propose the idea of decomputing as a way to simultaneously tackle uh, AI's environmental degradation and also what I would describe as its social degradation. Uh, so that brings me to my penultimate question. You'll be relieved to hear, which is: Does decomputing mean I have to get rid of my laptop? So. Um, because I'm, I mean, I asked the question because I think the idea, the term decomputing, it does sound a bit like getting rid of computers, right? And to some extent, it is, you know, because there has to be limits. We have to have some idea of competing within limits. We have to prioritize care for life. We have to focus much more on low power infrastructure. We have to focus much more on salvage, reuse, repair, all of those things. But the idea of decomputing is not. You know, that, that's more kind of an effect of decomputing. To me, the idea of decomputing is uh, about a few primary ideas. One of them is degrowth. Um, I think if you look at AI and its absolute fetishization of scale, all of these ridiculous parameters, um, or the number of parameters and the ridiculous numbers involved in the processing and the claims made as a result of those things, this to me is a, it's a bit like GDP. You know, it, th these are just empty metrics. And they really, what they really conceal is the construct, the destruction that happens in order to bring them about. I think these are all forms of destruction who are primary, who are um, founded on the idea of infinite growth. So decomputing is about degrowth. It's also about um, a decolonial standpoint, a decolonial stance that delegitimizes what's happening at the moment with this reinstantiation of a logic, a colonial logic, particularly around very material resources, but also in other ways. And uh, it's a rejection of the of this kind of um, assetization process that happens around uh, the infrastructure of AI and really a kind of argument for social production and for commonization. Um, and it's a direct challenge to this idea of solutionism, this idea that it's a, it's a direct challenge to AI as a diversion. It's saying that what AI is specifically doing is blocking our ability to think of any other kind of answers. So to me, de this, the concept of decomputing is really a, a route to the idea of just transition. So the idea of just transition, which has been around since the previous era of automation, but is what it really generally means now, I think, is um, justice for workers and communities under a transition to a decarbonized economy. And I think decomputing to me is the, the AI-focused thrust towards uh, the idea of a just computing. It takes seriously to me uh, one of the fundamental slogans of the Luddites, which was put down, so essentially get rid of or destroy, put, but put down all machinery hurtful to the commonality. And grand, you know, grand words, and in their day, that meant, you know, taking a hammer to the steam loom. But what does it mean now? And that's my final question. And well, I guess there is a little bit of self-promotion there, but um, it is also what I'm talking about, right? How do we resist AI? And yes, in the book, my primary um, proposal, I suppose, was for this idea of workers and people's councils. And there are many arguments for that in the book. Uh, essentially, it's uh, a mode of opposing automatized hierarchies um, with a kind of horizontal autonomy. But really, the reason for it is, uh, is this idea of the, um, in, in a way, the non-dual nature of the problem. You know, we're, we're talking about something that is both a technical a technical structure and uh, a rendition of social experience, right? So it's techno-social. So a tactic to tackle it, to me itself, has to has to be techno, so it has to act on both the technical and the social at the same time. And that's really what I was proposing those forms of organization were, right? Because I don't think AI is, I don't, you know, to me, if there's something complicated about AI, it's not the maths, although you know, the maths can, can, can be quite complicated, right? Or even the architectures of something like a transformer model is genuine, genuinely complicated. But I don't think that's what really makes them complex. Those are complicated rather than complex. What makes AI complex is that it's an apparatus. So yes, it's a form of computation, but it's also a configuration of concepts. It's also a set of investments. It's also a range of policies. It's a group of institutions. And it's the subjectivities that result from all of these things. And they act together to produce certain kinds of worlds. So if we're going to change that situation, I think we need to be changing the apparatus. 
uh, changing the technical and social structures at the same time. Um, and you know, in the book, I refer to a concrete example from the 1970s, which is the Lucas Plan. And I could talk more about that. But what I'm really trying to get at there is that the, to me, the effect of AI on the world is fundamentally one of precarization. So it makes lives in general more precarious. And at the same time, um, as we increasingly see, is involved in environmental destruction, thereby making uh, biological life more precarious. And the alternative really is a form of just transition uh, from, from the bottom up, where AI is a kind of metapolitics of optimization. I think we need some kind of counter counter politics. AI is an apparatus that produces the world. We need forms of action that are explicitly trying to reconstitute alternative apparatuses at the level of re-establishing relations between material forms and our abilities, our sense of agency. So what I'm trying to argue for is that whatever we do about AI, it takes the form of an alternative apparatus that supports the recomposition of collective subjects at the same time as technical practices for the common good. Okay, we got there. Thanks very much indeed for your patience in listening to that. Um, I hope that some of those questions rang a bell with you. It may be that I just need to clarify some of the things that I said anyway. In any case, um, yeah, I look forward to whatever kind of discussion ensues. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for, for the presentation. For, uh, I think uh, your uh, your references were pretty much uh, known to to the audience, but we will ask if, if anyone needs some some clarification on some aspects of your of your presentation. We will uh, um, we will ask just uh, to break the ice. I will uh, start asking a couple of questions, and then uh, we will open the floor as usual to people in the room and uh, also to people uh, uh, online. At the moment, I, I'm not able to see how many people are uh, um, online. Maybe we can try to... So if someone can... Uh, I suggest uh, just to to book... Uh, uh, if, if you have any questions, just... Uh, Click on the icon to raise your hand and okay, yeah, oh, quite quite a lot. Okay. Yes, as, as, as expected, yes. Um so I'm just uh, uh following from uh, the conclusion of your of your speech. So the uh, forms of uh, uh, resistance to AI and most importantly to all what AI represents. So you rightly pointed the fact that, uh, for example, education has been uh, uh, into the uh, framework of uh, algo algorithmicization for quite a uh, quite long time. So paradoxically, now this advent of AI can be an, even an opportunity to, to ask ourselves as educators what education as uh, as uh, uh, become, and uh, um, but in terms of uh, of uh, uh, your uh, uh, idea of, of the computing, the growth, my my question is uh, would be uh, within the framework of representative democracy, how likely you think these. Uh, Ideas we, we we see that even less far less radical ideas find nowadays very uh, very difficult to to be represented in the framework of representative democracy, which is now the the, the framework at least in the, in Western uh, in in Western countries. Where do you see? I'm I'm curious to know if you have experience, if you have knowledge of any uh, experience where. Uh, you can see uh, a way of uh, uh, seeing these uh, uh, these ideas uh, 
being uh, represented maybe not now maybe not uh, tomorrow but uh, in a um, in a reasonable future so that's a, that would be my comment on your on the last part of your of your uh, presentation um i then would leave the the floor to to other people to okay maybe we can uh, we can collect a few questions and then uh, uh how do, do you prefer then if you can uh, uh, to be honest i'd prefer to do it one at a time simply because i've got issues of my own long uh, short-term memory so um it's probably easier for me to i'm not a very big cash i'm afraid so if i'm able to to, to respond to your point and then i'd very happily take as many you know I'd, i'll try to be brief uh so we can have more of a discussion i think you know um you have asked a very big question. I, I think it's really interesting. In the book, I think I made probably more, but maybe not enough, of um, the re resonance was a term that I use quite a lot, and I think it's quite useful because it's a way of trying to articulate the cross effects of these fundamentally entangled um, aspects of reality. Uh, our technical systems, you know, our social systems, our own. Uh, our own psyches, you know, all the things being fundamentally indivisible, although distinct. And why I'm, why I'm saying that is because the very term representative democracy is so interesting that way. If we think of the kind of systems that AI is, it's only one example of really, which are uh, systems that claim to represent reality in some way, you know, the, the, an, an AI model is, is itself a, a mode of representation. And I think it's, it's interesting to me that, um, I'm not saying we can dispense with representations, but it does seem to be that, uh, you know, an over-reliance on modes of representation, whether politically or technically, um, have shown a profound weakness. And uh, so, you know, it's it's implicit within your term that representative democracy is not the only form of democracy. I mean, I, I would think of myself as dem a Democrat, democratic, but I think it's um, it, the kinds of democracy we offer that are very... Uh, narrowed actually and um there isn't much at work for example you know even in the university these days um so that seems to me a pretty good place to to reintroduce some uh, potentially under the uh oh, I'm sorry my dog is really doing oh, yeah that seems to be a pretty good place to try and reintroduce some uh, and quite critically in relation to ai because it is both uh well it's product of workplaces um and therefore carries all of the traces and, and genealogy of those places that it's created but more profound is being applied in all sorts of workplaces um in a way that clearly amplifies and accentuates the lack of democracy in those places i mean you know so-called gig work you know is, is the removal of any pretense that as a worker, you uh, well, you really exist as a, um, a valid being in your own right, let alone having any say in anything. And that goes all the way through. I mean, that goes uh, all the way through to the the very creations of the data sets. You know, uh, I find there are, there are AI is such a pantheon of interesting characters. I mean, Fei Fei Li, who you know was the founder of uh, ImageNet, you know, is d does really seem to have a profound disregard for you know the contributions of the thousands of people who were. Uh, exploitatively employed to generate the, that data set and that's carried on so th what i'm trying to say is that um the issue of of voice the issue of um participation rather than representation um uh, are exactly one of the reasons why i was trying to focus on um forms you know and i picked on the council form that uh to some ways invert that and and i guess the way i see it in practice really is not complicated and possibly not very helpful but i would see it as uh, for example in a university where the um you know the the executive management have the bright idea of um you know signing a partnership with a large big tech corporation because they believe that ai can get rid of some of those troublesome uh, academics or whatever it is you know should be opposed there and then by um, the self-organization of students and uh, educators in some democratic form, rather than expecting, as you say, I think with some skepticism, that uh, petitioning the existing representational forms will necessarily have an effect. If it wasn't really obvious, I mean, just to cut to the chase, if it wasn't really obvious that 
those democratic forms are about as plausible as the neoliberal system itself right now. It's very clear that any idea of representative democracy has already been captured by forces that are deeply inimical to the well-being of most people one way or the other, whether those forces are uh, big tech's you know, determination to support fossil fuels at the same time as generating its own carbon um, producing mechanisms or, you know, literally fascist political forces. None of these things, th these things are what's taken over. <laughs> We've got this AI safety institute in the UK, which is entirely there to make sure that nothing gets in the way of this, you know, rapacious expansion of AI. So, you know, I, I realise your question was couched you know, with some scepticism towards those things being feasible. And, and what I'm saying is that I absolutely agree, uh, plus 10 times 10. And that I think what I was trying to get to in councils is in some ways, uh, an optimistic message that actually we can just start here and now, wherever it is that we're impacted by these things in trying to get together in a, in the form of a critical pedagogy in a way, in the form of getting together and saying, we've got a shared problem, you know, and we need to, to start uh, coming up together with some shared responses. Okay. Um, what I would say, what I was just to say concretely, one, one of the reasons, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, I'll go on too long, but one of the things that interests me about the idea of decomputing is that data centers are such a physical instantiation of all of this stuff. AI itself, I, I won't rant, but AI itself is one of the reasons it's so interesting to me is because it's a convergence of almost everything at the same time. You know, it converges all of the historical forces, political and social forces into this one mechanism that accelerates all of the mostly negative content of those forces and data centers are the physical instantiation of that so one thing that has happened is there has been successful and ongoing community resistance to data centers in some places you know in the netherlands for example and um ongoing resistance in chile for example because you've got these data centers being set up in places where there's been a 10-year drought already so you know i think um one of the reasons why the decomputing idea interests me is exactly because of giving this a real, local, uh, actionable focus. Yes. Yeah, so in the in, in your book, you you explain very clearly how AI, among other things, also accelerates the crisis of uh, representative democracy in in uh, in many ways. Um, my, uh, Mauricio, may I say something uh, to thank our the speaker, um, I think that then uh, that uh, your message uh, has been uh, very clear, very strong, and very persuasive. Let me mention that um, in February 2019, we had a meeting uh, here at Nexa, uh, the title of which was In Quest of Countervailing Powers. Mm -hmm. We are searching for countervailing powers and use the concept of bottom-up of voice. Well, representative democracy, yes, of course, uh, but uh, it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Collective action is a priority here. And here comes my question to you, uh, which is based on a local example. You mentioned Three Miles Island. I think that not everybody remembers Mm. that this was a nuclear plant meltdown in the United States 30 years ago. At the same time, in Italy, I was teaching in the south of Italy, near Lecce. At Brindisi, we had a coal plant, which was extremely polluting. And there was a lot of collective action to close it down because uh, uh, the uh, benefits of uh, such a plant uh, were much lower than the cost in terms of pollution, and uh, it was pollution to the detriment, detriment of the local people, so it was localized. Now, what happens these days, this happened, uh, this was closed down gradually, but it's going to be reopened exactly like Three Miles Island. Why? Because Microsoft, and I don't know whether KKR or um, the, the Larry Fink uh, uh, outfit uh, um, um, causing up to the Italian government uh, to strike a deal whereby uh, Enel, the owner of the closed plant, is going to sell it uh, to have it reactivated. Now my question to you is, why did we have active 
opposition 30 years ago, and nobody is even talking about this now. I called my friends in Lecce, I still have many friends in Lecce, and asked them, is anything happening? And they said, no. And then asked, why was it happening 30 years ago? It's not happening today. And I stopped here. Mm -mm. Again, you know, brilliantly, uh, uh, you know, nothing less than I'd expect, I guess. These are pretty big questions. And um, I mean, I can only offer an opinion. I would say, you know, that's 30 years of neoliberalism. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that does happen. I think that's one of the, again, you know, one of the uh, currents I was trying to identify in the book is really that um, AI is fascinating because it is something very particular. It's a real thing. It's a real technology and a real set of operations and a real set of uh, associations. But at the same time, none of this is actually new. Um, and what it's doing is accelerating and amplifying processes that are already there. One of the main ones being you know, hyper-individuation and separations of various kinds and in various dimensions. And I think um, we are reeling and recoiling from those things. I think um, most of us would feel in some way or other pretty battered by the last 30 years. But um, that, you know, it simply isn't the case that there is no active resistance to these different dimensions happening right now. Not in this case, I totally accept, and not in, in many other really, really important things. But... Um, Again, one of the reasons why, you know, just harping on why I'm kind of, uh, I guess it would be fair to say, enthusiastic about the idea of decomputing is because in those, uh, in the very idea of just transition is a convergence of the workers' movement and the climate movement, whatever those things consist of, or workers' movements or workers' uh, identified concerns and climate concerns, um, which which are often actually divided. And, 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 and in the same way, I never expected, I, I, I think there is elements of people inside the tech worker community who are uh, do consider themselves more and more uh, needing to do something to resist in some way and uh, you know that, that's a great thing but I don't really think that the powerful movements that will um, interrupt AI will be sort of in a way focused on AI they will be coming from the convergence of um, the things that AI does the harms that it does the, the provocations that is but also the way AI I mean it's kind of it, it, it's a very dual sort of um, payload. You know, AI at the same time as amplifying all of the injustices that already exist, at the same time touches all of the people touched by those already existing injustices. And therefore, in some ways, has the potential to converge all the movements of people who, not, not in some simplistic, you know, happy, unproblematic way, but has the, the potential at least to, to bring into... To, contact or collision of some kind the movements of people already oppose those things and there is already um you know especially obviously among young people there is a lot of resistance around uh the climate crisis there are there is in this country what happened after those pogroms what i call pogroms those right far right conspiracy theory driven riots uh a week later there were demonstrations 10 times as big by uh, a huge range of ordinary people who just came out onto the streets to defend the next set of targets that were published on the internet and just said, no, no way is this going to happen. So I think, you know, I, I can't speak to that particular locality and I'm not surprised that there isn't resistance because there isn't that much visible resistance in most places. But I do think AI is one of the, only one of the potential catalysts for forms of resistance. It is a potential convergence points for resistance that already exist. I just want to finish by saying, you know, for me, what's most inspiring at the moment is a very, you know, a bit of work that I'm only making a small contribution to, but it's working with First Nations in Canada around the effect that AI is having on them, mainly through, you know, the, because uh, First Nations, you know, museums and archives are, are kind of different to what they might be to somebody like me. They're, they're vital ways of um, preserving what's left of their sort of culture and, and identity. Um and, and AI, you know, sort of colliding with the whole sort of museums industry. Anyway, not to go off into a rabbit hole. The point is that I'm having these discussions, I'm participating in this space where essentially people who've been resisting for 500 years, who've been nearly been wiped off the map, but haven't been, who are still there, you know, find very easily and very understand very quickly why they need to also resist AI. In fact, it's amazing how closely 
their understanding of their own ability to resist, you know, the 500 years of empire, the patterns they've learned from that map so neatly and and, and sort of um, clearly onto the patterns that I think are sort of there to say, why should we resist AI? And I think, you know, that they're, they're an inspiration, not only because they've been resisting for 500 years, but because at the heart of this is really having a different idea of what the world could be. And there are still existing alternative ideas about what the world could be. Those ideas are further away than they ever used to be from our experience, but they're still there. And those are the things that I think also potentially need to be reclaimed because in order to really challenge AI means challenging um, what we see as the potential, you know, potential for alternative worlds. Yeah, something like that. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, in my list, uh, I have a few people who, who booked for, for a question. Guido Natola Diega, Stefano Puglia, Maria Luce Lupetti, and then there is a question from, from the room. May I recommend to be concise in your uh, questions so we can leave room for uh, these questions and maybe, and maybe more. Guido? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Nexus Center and uh, I'm a professor of law and technology in Glasgow. Strathclyde University, uh, thank you so much. It's it's great to hear, uh, you know, you talking and and it's reassuring that so many of us have been thinking about similar things from uh, complementary perspectives. Um, and, and in my own research, I also conclude about kind of thinking about collective action and bottom-up action. And that's also based on the work that the Nexus Center has been doing. And um, my main concern and my partly unanswered uh, question uh, is uh, how do we uh, sort of scale up uh, all those efforts uh, that we can see, you know, uh, around the world, uh, you know, efforts of collective action, um, you know, and I think there must be, I mean, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I've just ordered it, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm, I, I just want to know what you think in terms of what can we learn from the existing examples and and maybe that therein there lies the answer to how do we scale up i'm thinking you mentioned data centers definitely something that is local actionable is 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 definitely something that uh you know something that we want to you know see in a movement that can be that can be successful uh but in, in my my own kind of research i've been thinking about you know uh the the right to repair movement and why is it has it been successful because it's a convergence of different uh movements and different interests for example you know sustainability and digital rights you know so that kind of a interest convergence could be another feature of these of you know the success of these collective actions is there anything else that we can you know, learn uh, well, thanks very much. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm also feeling sort of a, I'm getting kind of kind of reflected validation of, from what you're saying about that, particularly about that movement and the idea that it, you know, uh, what it really represents is this kind of interesting convergence and overlap, and that produces something particular uh, that has a power of its own. You know, obviously, in general terms, that's really what I'm hoping will um, come out of various efforts to oppose the different effects that AI has. Uh, um, I guess, you know, when I was writing the book, I was really, you know. Not, not really a sophisticated process because I was looking at my own journey with the AI stuff where I, I literally started out by trying to write a book about AI for the people. I literally started out, not AI for good. I wasn't quite on that path, but I was thinking that didn't like any technology, you know, there's some potential for sort of democratic control and under the right conditions. And, blah, blah, blah. and I just got to the point where yeah, this, this particular technology is just not happening that way because it is such a clear to me uh, you know, almost, um, how would you say, black and white uh, instantiation, concretization of particular sets of uh, worldviews and relationships. But therefore, you know, uh, if you're writing a book about it and you want to sort of uh, say there should be something else, you, you flip it around. And I was trying quite concerned to to not do scaling, you know, because scaling is exactly, uh, you know, it's, it's so interesting how, and I mean, we, I know we have at least one semi in the room, right? So it's so interesting how, uh, you know, how powerfully we're uh, immersed in un unchallenged concepts that shut off other potential, potential ways of doing things. Um, 
so that you know when i was writing the book there was a lot of stuff about I mean, how you know what, what we needed was a kind of i don't know a socialist ai or whatever else it is you know this um but not anything different really and i, I feel that you know very very simply federation rather than scaling is is the potential for um spreading these kind of movements i think there are very few but there are some existing uh systems that evidence the idea that a more uh authentically federated system can have legs as they say in english you know and i'd say rojava or the autonomous uh, regions of northeast syria are an example of that you know there are people who are organizing entire social systems and economies you know under 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 constant assault um not perfectly i'm not literally not waving a flag <laughs> for them but uh you know are managing to adopt or at least diligently attempt to adopt a different pattern and i think the you know the the surfacing of the fact that those alternative patterns have always existed that people have always either enacted them or at least attempted to over the course of time is why um you know surfacing forgotten histories is really important um that's why brought up the Lucas plan in the book um, because it was a techno-political, a techno, yeah, essentially a techno-political example of that. Um, for me, that's one area where, you know, because I'm not actually, let's throw all the computers in the sea. That's not really my thing. I think all computers have a problem and, you know, whatever laptop you have is tied into this global system of e-waste and everything else. It's not easy to figure out how much computers would be good. But I do wonder if computers have a role to play here. You know, I am really interested in the, the sort of um, sideline cybernetics of people like Stafford Beer, the whole idea of the viable systems model, which isn't really even a technical, it's, it's, a, it's a technical model, but it's not about a computational system. But I am interested that, you know, perhaps um, where local alternatives become established, um, you know, there's there are existing modes of coordination that we can lean to, some of which may actually benefit from forms of computation. Probably not from AI, but I think fundamentally it's it's you know the danger in all of these. Let's see the danger in the data center stuff is that it is very local. It's very much not here to push it somewhere else. Push it where people don't have the capacity to resist. And what seems to be a feature of all movements that consider themselves to be both local and global, if you like, or uh, you know, one of the symptoms of solidarity, I would say, is a kind of internationalist perspective. And I, I don't, you know, I, I would see decomputing. That's, I guess, why the decolonialism is an important bit of it. You know, it can't really do the job unless it sees the local action so very clearly as part of a coordinated international activity or movement, even if that coordination isn't explicit. And I think it's a bit of a difficult area to talk about exactly because all experiments in that direction are so thoroughly uh, erased as quickly as possible. And that's, of course, not a coincidence. So, you know, we have only shreds of evidence to go on. But I think there's enough, uh, you know, whether it's the in Rojava or um, in other places in, in the world or in known history where people have organized in different ways, it's very appropriate to me to, um, you know, sort of loot those examples as models of organization and coordination for movements that pose the harms of AI. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Dan. We have a question from uh, from the room. Please briefly introduce yourself. Sir. Yes, again, uh, my name is David Schmudi. Uh, I work in the space of digital identity at a company called Yorba. And I have a brief question. Uh, in you know, over 40 years ago now, Langston Winter asked, do artifacts have politics? And we've had so much time and we know that the answer is yes. And so, so the question is, why do we ask the question, is it fascist? Why don't we say it is fascist? Is it, why don't we shortcut this and all the explanation and all the words and just say it concretely and go from there in an effort to galvanize? Great. <laughs> you know, I mean, um... I was, yeah, I think your point about Langdon Winner is absolutely, the more that I find out about thought of the 1970s, I would say, the more I feel aligned with it. And, and maybe that's not so surprising since, you know, it was 73 was really the sort of um, 
violent birth of neoliberalism. So if one aligns differently to that, it's perhaps not surprising that the 1970s is a place to go back to. But it did, does seem that there was so much, uh, so much of this has been thought before, not simply by Langdon Winner, but there's a, there's a great example I came across a couple of days ago, which I really need to research more, is this kind of 78 questions for technology. Have you heard of this one? It was out of a, I don't know, it wasn't Jacques Ellul, but it was out of that kind of milieu. And it was, it was kind of, uh, you know, it was exactly this. It was to me a, a proactively Luddite approach to technology, which said, okay, before we go anywhere with this technology, we're going to ask, what's it going to do about this? What effects is it going to have in this way? How can we control this? And, um, you know, I mean, the fact that that hasn't happened, of course, is, is, is exactly an expression of the world system that we've been living under. Why don't we call it fascist? I guess what I'm trying to get at is the bit about, um, which is just like my particular interest, is the what what is almost a kind of um hobbling of politics by not sufficiently taking into account the political aspect of technical mechanisms if you like um like in the uk political history for example there was the luddites that was about 1812 to 1816 at the same time we had a movement called the chartists and they were the ones that really um i mean they they had a very tough fight for about 80 or 100 years but they did eventually kind of win in a way and what they were after was the vote we're going back to the representative systems thing again. You know, they 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 were the ones that saw the solution being, uh, you know, universal suffrage. Um, but at the same time, the industrial revolution was happening unconstrained. You know, and and the the um, the absence of democracy in any of that was um, firmly rooted. So I guess what I'm trying to get at, or at least what I'm fascinated by in my expression of AI, is whereas I might have a political perspective, I find it being sort of um, extended in a way or, you know, no, I don't mean in a, in a, in a superior way, but sort of expanded, let's say, um, to a techno-political perspective, which is why I use apparatus, because that that's an idea that I, that I basically borrowed or stole or whatever, adapted from uh, Karen Barad. And um, this is also partly because my background is as a physicist, and so I found that stuff kind of amenable. But it's, it's primarily because, um, going back to our, our earlier uh, a question as well. I think it was Marco was was it asking the question about you know where's the resistance? It's you know the the it's about the the simultaneous production of material and meaning that are right. That's what that's what her understanding of an apparatus is. It's the thing that exists prior to the explicit things that we would recognise either as social structures or as psychological mechanisms or as technical structures. And I guess I'm trying to be radical in the sense of going to the root and saying, well, you know, we need different conceptions and different mobilizations of apparatuses, not a single apparatus, but apparatuses. So it's about challenging things on that basis. And and I guess I feel aligned to, um, you know, I mean, I don't actually think we know or necessarily completely understand what Deleuze and Guattari were saying about most of that. But I think they were onto something similar as well. That's why they came up with the term microfascism. It's not basically... I guess, two things, really. It's not enough to oppose fascism. You know, fascism is almost too late. It's never too late. I mean, it's never too late to oppose fascism. But by the time it's got to be fascism, it's already a long way down the road, right? That's already very late. And secondly, technologies at any given time, in the broadest sense, have a fundamental role in incubating whatever we call the bit that comes before. You know, they are an indivisible part of it. So I'm trying to articulate a technopolitics that intervenes prior to uh, the empowerment of fascist movements that and that works specifically on how the technology, the technical mechanisms with which society is pervaded with help to either build or potentially discourage that kind of development. So I'm not disagreeing with it in any way. I'm just trying to give you a sort of... Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to express why I'm trying to articulate this idea of the importance of technopolitics. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next in line is Stefano Puglia. The dog's driving me mad, so she can come and say hello, and then I'm going to boot her. Yeah. Can I say hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, lovely dog. Hello, this is Stefano here. Um, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, all right, hello, Dan. And everyone, sorry, I have no camera on me. Uh, I'm a freelance engineer and educator based in central Italy, but thinking of working around the world. Um, I haven't gone through uh, your book yet, Dan, 
but uh, reading your article on resisting AI for um, a just transition and listening to you today, I found lots of arguments that resonate with the recent essay that Davide Laman and I uh, wrote about digital, digital degrowth, uh, as we called it, in the age of big tech AI. Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's in Italian, and it's been uh, recently published on an Italian journal called Quaderni della Decrescita. <clears throat> And it's mostly about uh, imagining alternative visions of the existing artificial intelligence, which reinforces the power of uh, neoliberal uh, digital capitalism, as in my humble opinion, what you say and write does confirm indeed. Um, one of these visions that we have imagined is the promotion of what we called solutions of collective artificial intelligence um, as a form of resistance to AI as a service which is currently at the core of big tech's enormous investments and profits. Um, basically, our starting point here, here is the idea that local communities should take greater control over their own instruments and, and resources, uh, fostering decentralization and direct participation in community management. So what we have envisaged here is, for example, the use of free and open data, uh, open technologies like uh, open source software, um, you know, bear in mind that we are engineers, and, and also models. Um, I am a data, data scientist myself, so think about you know, those available on Hugging Face, for instance. And above all, sovereign digital state infrastructures, uh, which should be built and funded with the taxpayers' money. Um, and all this to enable local uh, low-scale services, which are beneficial for local communities only and distant from global profits. I was now wondering uh, what you think about such approach and these ideas in general, and whether you might find them kind of feasible, also in relation to your idea of decomputing in favor of the commons and commonality as you write in your, in your article. Essentially, have you also thought about very, very practical examples, you know, once again, we're engineers, on, uh, on these matters that could be easily communicated to the masses, the, the old polloi, so to speak, to widen the movement to resistance. Uh, thanks a lot. And thanks to the guys at uh, Politecnico uh, di Torino for organizing this uh, beautiful event. <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Stefano. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I th you know, we're, we're clearly on the same team, right? You know, in in, in terms of, I think, you absolutely, know, yeah, absolutely, both what we're aspiring to, you know, and and also um, because of our. Focus, you know, I mean, I, I do work in a computing department and I, you know, do teach technology, although most of what I teach these days is critiques of technology. Uh, but, you know, I, um, and I'm not, you know, because, because I don't think that's the right way to put it. I'm not anti-technology because I think that's a ridiculous statement because I think not just because we need technologies, but because the very concept we have of what a technology is, is specifically historic, That you know, is a, is a product of this historic moment and therefore in a way tainted by, you know, everything that forms this particular historical moment. And I think that's my, you know, I, I, I've, you know, I've been, been around the block, you know, and I've done stuff with open data and I've done stuff with open source software. I, st I still do support open source software. And I do have myself felt the rush of enthusiasm and, and, and sort of, um, you know, this belief that because these things do in some sense, you know, uh, express, um values that i would very strongly identify with um that there's an exciting prospect of uh you know building things that can um help broader situations that also um require and promote those kind of values so you know community technologies of one kind or another and uh, and, and community control technologies and, and, and technologies founded for and by communities and i think my you know where i'm at at the moment i guess it would be uh i still feel the need to step back in order to go forward you know i think it, what we what we think with you know like i mean i'm pretty influenced by donna haraway as well you know and i think she has uh, puts it much better in ways that i don't immediately have to hand but you know these things these technologies are also uh, part of what we think with and through and uh, i feel i guess particularly with ai you know that it it has such a powerfully affecting and shaping effect on what we can think of as possible that what we can think of as effect, you know, even the idea of effective or efficient, you know, like an efficient solution is, you know, 
um, not just a product of AI, but that term efficient is, um, you know, such a has such a long genealogy and very problematic one. I feel that we really need to think so incredibly differently in order to be able to understand what it is that we might do with the things that we now call computing or even data in order for it to be part of something genuinely different. Now, that does sound a bit like a cop out. I would say it sounds a bit like, oh, well, we have to all, you know, go and do some philosophy before we can do anything. And I, I don't think that's the case um, because, it, to be honest, I don't really think that philosophy is it by itself ever change anything anyway. I do think philosophical ideas are useful because I am talking about reconceptualizations. And I think that has to be done in practice. I guess I just don't I, I don't see a kind of transfer uh, for me, for me, you know, I, I mean, your efforts sound highly admirable and uh, I really hope they have beneficial consequences. The interest I have is not in a kind of um, potential for sort of a, uh, goodness transfer or, com- or, or sort of community benefit transfer from our existing understandings of technologies, our existing working with technologies that we give in some way out to communities and then things will be better. They may be in some sense, but I'm looking for non-reformist reforms. You know, I'm looking for actual uh, change, radical change. And I think that will come out of situations where we're forced to we're forced to, by the processes that we adopt ourselves, by the collective processes we adopt ourselves, by the challenges that we take on, having to reconceptualize things much more fundamentally. Um, so, for example, just and, and and I hope this doesn't seem like picking on a term, but the word sovereign to me is is very widely uh, used at the moment, and um, understandably in the sense of being counterposed to sort of neoliberal uh, forces and flows. But I think it is it is. And, and uh, you know, I, I remember the the Barcelona sort of, um, you know, in Barcelona City Council, you know, had this whole, uh, uh, you know, data sovereignty and you know local tech, and I, no. some of the guys did that. That's great, yeah. but it's actually completely problematic to me. Sovereignty is a term that is to me entirely Schmittian. If you know what I mean, that the, the sort of if we're talking the legal philosophers in the room, right? It's, it's Carl Schmitt to me. Even this sort of um, binary decisionism itself has resonates far too strongly with, what, with our understandings of what computation is in the first place, resonates far too strongly with the kinds of politics that are on the rise at the moment. So I don't, I don't have a, I'm, I'm not trying to diss what you're doing. Uh, and I don't have an easy answer either. But I do think that, um, that for me, you know, the, the, what will come out will have to come out of uh, far more uh, sort of, holistic uh forms of contestation that doesn't have to be far away i mean the reason i used the lucas plan was simply because those people came up with for example hybrid vehicles uh, plans for wind generators and everything else at you know 30 or 40 years before all the climate movement was um, falling back on those things exactly because they were challenging the hierarchies of their workplace, they were challenging the economic decisions of their time, and they were pervaded by, even though they were mainly blokes, they were mainly men, they were pervaded by what was happening at the time in terms of the rise of feminism and the early startings of, of the environmental movement, not the climate movement, but the environmental movement. So, you know, I think I'm, I'm searching for contexts that bring, if you like, in a slightly alchemical way, bring those different dynamics together to try to fuse something differently. And that doesn't mean that the kind of activity you're talking about is is wrong or wasted or anything like that. But it's not, for me, uh, I'm searching for uh, v- vessels that can be transform- transformatory, e- even in our understanding of what it is to um, do technology for the common good. Maybe you, you, you're talking about, you know, a fundamental shift and change of, you know, cultural paradigm. Um, yes, maybe. But, but I think there's an interesting. Sorry, uh, sorry, that's very rude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, because the only thing that I want to say is that, of course, you know, I, 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 what I told you about, of course, we have no time. But I, I just mentioned one of the visions that we're proposing in our essay. Uh, in fact, you know, the other one is uh, a bit more utopian. It's the, the one with which we basically close our work, and that's about. And we start by saying that we don't want to respond to technology with more technology because in, in a way you know this is what right. we what we what we will we, we'll still be doing uh, so i understand exactly your points and i totally agree with you on the fact that uh for a radical and and, and um, um and uh real change we would need to change maybe you know a cultural paradigm 
um, it, it's not very easy, but perhaps you know degrowth can come um, can come you know help here. Uh, decolonizing the imagination, as they say, uh, is also something that you know if you think about you know the idea that technology must be everywhere, all around, all the time. You know, this is something that pervades our society today. And we have to kind of, and trying to, you know, change this is is not easy, but that's perhaps, you know, the real answer. So I was I was referring to what we did on the technology side, but I'm, 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 I do agree with you completely on the fact that perhaps for a real change, we need to do more than that. I'm just hoping that it's not, you know, like you say, I agree with you, these are cultural changes, but I also don't think, they need to be approached as sort of some giant project for the you know for the sort of uh, that will take many decades and so on and so forth. My my I guess my personal experience as well, you know, is that um, transformation can happen quite quickly in ways that uh, you know are also uh, extremely empowering um, when there's the situation sort of calls for it. If you like, you know, if for example, you know, my college has just been busy sacking hundreds of staff and mm -hmm. you know trying to to um, turn it itself into something completely different. Yeah. If, for example, some members of the faculty suddenly found themselves, you know, faced with uh, you know redundancy or you know the occupation of some offices and the running of their faculties didn't been an, an autonomous entity they would have to be they would be faced with a whole number of um, interconnecting questions as to how they conceptualize education what how they practically organize things how they raise an income and how they you know who, who does the dishes sure. you know who cleans who cleans the building these things are, are fundamentally uh, you know part of the same i don't want to use the word stack but i'm going to part of the same stack if you like and that's one of the reasons why i was trying to again in the book you know uh, emphasize emphasize this idea of care both as a as a concept as because it, i felt it was the inversion of what ai brings to the party and um, but also because it was you know trying to focus on how none of this ridiculous uh, not yours, but the, the sort of I'm just I'm sore from having listened to too much Jeffrey Hinton on the radio. You know how much of this ridiculous, abstracted nonsense, uh, you know, uh, masculine conversation ignores the way the world is reproduced on a day to day basis, yep. which is not by people like him or me, for that matter, you know, but by the unseen, invisible labor and and emotional labor and care of so many other people, the majority of whom are, of course, women, and are, of course, the majority of whom are in the global south, you know? It's like, these are the dimensions that, if they're left out of any project to reconstitute, you know, uh, technopolitics, make it less powerful, let's say. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, well, unfortunately, we almost run out of time. We have three minutes left. Uh, I have more questions booked. Uh, I don't know, very uh, telegraphic questions from, uh, we have uh, Marco Rondina here in the room and uh, Ludovica Pazzeri uh, online, uh, but uh, I think we we are we are a bit late to... Uh, no, I'm going to say Okay. So um, yes, sorry we can't. Uh, we we that, that yes that that would has been a very a very uh, intense and uh, in depth uh, discussion. Many things uh, are uh, left for future discussions. I hope I I, I do really hope uh, our paths will cross again soon. Uh, maybe in the UK or. Uh, you might come to visit uh, Turin at some point. And uh, uh, so, uh, greetings to your beautiful greyhound. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have to take a photo uh, now. That's my task. Yeah. I have to. Okay. And uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah. And, you know, thanks everybody for. You know, it's so great to have a response, basically, and to find also that there are so many related ideas and, and, and sort of relatable enthusiasms already out there. That's affirming for me, because if it was just about something that I was thinking, it would be irrelevant. But I think the more that we can sort of find and connect the different ideas that we have, the more chance there is of something uh, that will have a real impact on dare I say history coming out of it. So um, thanks very much anyway for the invitation. And um, I've really enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Bye.